Hello, uh, good afternoon everyone. Um, <coughs> just a quick announcement, I'm powered by um, uh, day nurse at the moment, so I may splutter and cough through this presentation, so, um, or it may give me superpowers, I've never, I've never actually done a day nurse presentation before. Um, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm here to talk about a couple of pieces of work which, I'm, uh, which I've completed and, uh, and potentially if I get to the end of the 20 minutes uh, and I find myself with some time, I can talk a little bit about the current work I'm doing. Um, but I've never in my entire career managed to get almost past the halfway mark of my slides before the time's run out. So you might only get one piece, who knows. Yes, yeah, so the two pieces I want to speak about are um, <coughs> a video game uh, which I created called Beckett, which is in the gallery, Scottish Design Gallery through there, and won a BAFTA on Sunday, which was cool, um, and Marnie Wakes, which is a performance uh, piece which I've created. Um, it's also designed as a sort of randomized visual podcast as well. So um, the next slide is a video. Um, I believe the audio is connected, but I have no idea whether this is going to make your ears bleed or whether it's going to be like a, the, the flapping of a butterfly wing. So I'll, I'll let it play and we'll, we'll see what happens. Oh, yeah. Is an incredibly enigmatic sort of uh, trailer for the game which I released, um, which is called Beckett, and I would describe it as a work of digital fiction. It's a surreal noir, I'm just reading from the screen. Uh, it is a surreal noir told as an interactive mixed media experience. Um, so I threw a whole load of images together, which I'm hoping to sort of ad lib over the top. So let's see how this goes. Yeah, so, so Beckett itself is um, inspired by a whole number of things. Obviously, um, my inspiration comes very much from literature, theatre, and independent world cinema. And um, I've operated in video games for around, or across digital media for at least uh, a decade more. Before that, I was a writer. Um, I spent a lot of time as a journalist, actually, and I moved into television as a director. But I just saw the potential of digital media as outstripping those other things. You know, what you can do in digital media in terms of storytelling just really, really excites me. Um, so Beckett starts um, with this character, who happens to be Beckett, who's a, a, an, a, a, an older guy um, who suffers acutely from loss and basically doesn't have any reason to his life anymore. He's having a sort of ex existential crisis. Um, but his day-to-day -day is he's a missing persons uh, investigator. <clears throat> And the, the game itself is told on a very abstract canvas, and it, 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 it um, sort of merges top-down um, environmental storytelling um, with all manner of different things thrown over the top. It often looks like a Dadaist type canvas. And what you're effectively doing is the player is an influential force on this character piece, which is called Beckett. Now, interestingly, that face on that Beckett is the nearest thing you'll ever get to see to a human being across the entire game. And as you navigate Beckett around these environments, the environments come to life based only on what Beckett feels is important in the area, which is sort of quite important because one of the things I've always found frustrating with games is that the, notion, the protagonist is often just a puppet. They're often just a reason for you to interact with the, with the mechanics of the game. And from a storytelling point of view, I was very keen to sort of make Beckett himself a living, breathing entity that you have a relationship with, but, you, but you, you're, not puppet, you're not puppeteering him. And what was quite interesting about that is you, you get a narrative construct where you can move through the game 
based on the story he's experiencing, but actually the process of sort of um, unpicking or unraveling that story allows you to come to terms and work out who Beckett himself is and also the world in which he inhabits, which is a, a very fragile um, reality. So throughout the game itself, um, you look at various objects and the uh, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big I'm a big fan of sort of making fiction real um, so the, the, the big part of the story is about Beckett's relationship to this woman Amy Zabinski who he ended up marrying um, and he met her at a piano recital so I wanted to create a poster from that piano recital uh, sort of distress it frame it put in a photograph and actually this is quite sort of there's a lot of these key moments in the game and, and it also starts to um, starts to bring about the world because the world itself is, is a is a sort of it, it's it's quite a, 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 tw a dark grim twist on the reality we've got i mean beauty I, I, I try to frame beauty in this world as almost a sort of a counterculture movement um and having that sort of top-down abstract canvas where you're sort of trying to understand the environment, the actual mechanics of the game beyond sort of simple point-and-click explore and all the sounds and audio, audio visual stuff going on is um, all the key sort of plot elements in the story, um, we tackled in different, different overlays. So as you go through and you're unlocking stuff, you're ever seeing new stuff, you're hearing new, new, new things, or you're interacting with the world in a slightly different way, such as, a, such as an interactive transcript between Beckett and a woman who calls him and basically says, my, my son hasn't, hasn't returned back from work. And he's like, what, what, what you know, and he, he effectively dismisses it and goes, look, I don't do domestic cases. But he, um, he ends up having to take on this case. So as you go through, it is very much a collage of, of reality, um, sort of photography, um, sort of very sort of cut up sort of handmade stuff. Oh, and this is quite an interesting frame, actually. Um, a lot of my design methodology with computer games is there's a trend in games to sort of make interactive elements of glow or pulse or stuff like that. So I'm, I'm much more thinking, you know, we live in an interactive space, an interactive world. If the phone rings, your response to that is to pick up the receiver. If there's a knock at the door, you generally go to the door. If you come across a buzzer, you, you, you sort of know how to interact with that element intrinsically. So I try to build games only with naturalistic interaction mechani mechanisms, which means I don't need to break the illusion with, um, with stuff. The other thing I did do in here, though, is because the whole world is, is, is almost how Beckett perceives it emotionally, if something makes a sound, I did allow it to sort of morph and, 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 and shift if necessary, so you'd know it, it was something which to Beckett became of, of greater importance. <laughs> So all the characters Beckett meets along, his, along this route um, take any, f any single form. So this is a slice through an MRI scan. Um, some characters can be crushed beetles, old brooches. Um, the next one might be the market. Yeah, slices of meat, popcorn, coins. I did that deliberately because this is a, this is a game very much about the imagination and it's, it's a game which is meant to exist in your head more than it is on the screen. Everything which is in here, including the way it was audio designed, the sort of way it was written as a narrative, is all about sort of tapping into the things which make you who you are and, and letting the game start to form in your own head. So if you speak to the slice of meat and, um, and when they have, um, and when the characters do speak, they have these sort of um, they all have a different aesthetic as to how their sort of speech bubbles sort of appear, but also they all have a, a, a sonic equivalent. So when it's an entirely reading experience, but when you're reading, as these things come up, you might get a guttural cough, or you might get the sound of nails down a blackboard, or the sound of a hen clucking. But it's what's quite interesting is when you start putting these things together, every single person starts to create different interpretations of the story they've got. And if I, if I remember, there's an interesting anecdote about that. Um, when I was making the game as well, there's a, I say there's a lot of um, there's a lot of image, there's a lot of picture content. I started to see dead things everywhere, so I just assumed that this was some sort of a nice thing to integrate. And particularly when I found this pigeon, which sort of seemed quite angelic. I don't know whether it's just the way they, it was sitting on the paving stone. So, and uh, in, in addition to this, um, when I was dropping my daughters off at school um, in the playground, there was a rat with its intestines hanging out. So while all the other parents were running off to tell the janitors, I quickly got out my camera and took a picture. And that's in the game as well. So, but again. It, it, it's quite interesting because actually if you set if, if you set the player experience up such that such that as they're going through they're never quite sure what is going to hit them next i mean that's a very powerful driving mechanism whether it is a bit of uh, story via text whether it's an image whether it's a bit of video um there are moments where um 
stories exist within the, the framework which are told by other people. So I worked with a, a brilliant illustrator in uh, Glasgow called Sean Mulvena to create these sort of um, the, these sort of well, il illustrated back segments where you discover that the boy that Beckett's chasing down and actually suffers from this thing called the soft paranoia, which is a sort of a, a William Burroughs esque sort of in, inspired sort of thing. But um, yeah, and 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 the sort of the, the narrative of this secondary character starts to come to the fore about you know about about the life he's lived, and and why it is that he it, he's decided to to leave. Um, it's worth saying that within this, there is a play called Morgul on a Neck Bomb Live Here, which is the sort of center point. Basically, this, this explains the entire game. Um, if, in, in a sense, it's about these two characters who have um, who, who have diagnosed mental illnesses. Morgulons, when you think your skin's actually built of a fabric, and neck bombs, when you feel like under your skin you have beetles and ants scurrying under it. And, and this play, which is narrated by a, a, an amazing um, singer-songwriter called John Otway, who was performing in the 70s. He had a, um, I think his single was called uh, Car Baby, That's Really Free. And his, the B-side was called Beware of the Flowers, because I'm sure they're going to get you, yeah? And he's got an amazing voice, and he, and he, and he, and he narrated this for me. And, and, and basically, this whole, the whole premise of this play is the person who's, who's, uh, who's been told that he's, he's got a mental illness because he thinks his skin's made of um, fabric is picking up one of these fabric things, and as he picks it, the, the stitching unravels and his whole arm falls off and there's this sort of realization that you know he's completely bought into somebody else's version that his reality is false but maybe his reality is real and, and that's the sort of underlying feature of Beckett it's like whose reality are you playing in here is it Beckett is it the person that you're following is it the players and I've left that deliberately open because to tell you if I'm not, I'm not sure myself. So, um, <laughs> and, and, and in the final scenes, you've got all these quite sort of um, evocative, sort of deliberately, um, sort of not nice images, but uh, may, may, maybe make you sort of think and consider. Now, what's worth saying is, um, throughout the, the narrative construct of this, between every sort of scene, you get these um, generative um, piano, a bit like the one they heard on the trailer, these piano pieces, which have got these sort of short um, events about Beckett's pre life uh, up until the death of his wife. And um, through these, you get a sense of who Beckett is, the relationship he's, he, he had, and basically why he is the person who he is. And every one of them looks very different. Um, part of the reason I made them generative is because when you're making a game, you get very, very sick of playing the same thing again and again and again. So I love the fact I never knew where these uh, text boxes were going to be or what the, the merger or effects on the images behind. And there was some really nice output from that. So, um, and, and just to worth saying on that, it's like, you know, when I, when I created Beckett, it was very much, I see Beckett as a thing. I don't necessarily see it as a game. I see game as one of the outputs of what Beckett is. It actually existed as a vinyl first, which is for sale in the V&A downstairs, there you go. <laughs> or if you want one, you could maybe grab us afterwards, and I'm sure I've got some in the, in the office space. But um, that was good. So that, that's like a remix of the, of the memory tracks, all these sort of haunting piano things, which I sort of um, intercut with uh, field music and stuff like that. And um, it was nice. I sent that off to BBC Six Music anonymously. It doesn't have anything written on it, and they did play it, which was great. So um, <laughs> unless you've got any, well, we're not doing questions, are you? And, and how much time have I got? <laughs> five minutes to the next one maybe. Okay, so between Beckett coming out, which came out the 27th of February, and um, my starting at the V&A, which was in September, um, I decided to create this thing called Marnie Wakes, which is a series of 32 monologues. It's, an, it's presented as an unbound book, effectively, with some generative visuals as well. And what it is, it's a it's a, a reflection is the wrong word. It's, 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 it's the extraction of the loops which exist in your head when you're old and waiting for your next visitor to arrive. So um, each one of these is, a, is, is, is a, a, um, a revisit of the past. They all last between about 30 seconds and three minutes. And some are positive, some are negative. Some are from when she was a child, some are from when she was old, you know, when she met a second husband, or the, 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 the fact that she cheated on her first. So, and what was quite interesting, it's designed as a, as a performance piece. It's written without punctuation. All the spaces within the, all the, spaces within the pages are designed to influence the way it's read. 
Um, but the performance piece as well, it was, it, it was made as 32 because depending on time and space, um, you either pick four, eight, or 16 of these at random each performance. So the idea that no, if you, whichever performance you go to, you'll always get a different ordering and potential grouping. And I quite like that because actually because it is somebody effectively talking about their life, in a, in a, it's sort of got like an Alan Bennett type feel to it. Um, it means that the way you introduce them is always different. So you can come out of a, of a performance thinking maybe that this, you don't like this woman at all because of the things she's done, but the ordering will shift that. I also like the idea if everyone's getting something slightly different, it gives you a reason to sort of discuss um, afterwards. So an example, I'm not gonna read these, but um, yeah, it starts with the opening page, which just says, I'm not gonna an old uh, tongue quiets lips moving with words and repeat here again and, that, and yet. And then every, Every monologue has a slightly different uh, feel. Some are more, um, some some play with the sort of the layout of the ones are a bit more, uh, a bit more thing. But that that's the longest one. Everything sits on an A6 page. So yeah, that, that, that's, well, I'm trying to be quick, I've got two minutes. Um, Fragments of a Fictional Place is what I'm doing here, which is a series of character vignettes um, set in a fictionalized town in the east of Scotland. So at the moment I'm sort of researching and developing, and certainly in my own head, this sort of, the, what is this fictional, fictionalized town? I'm thinking of somewhere of less than 2,000 people. And I'm starting to sort of work out what makes these places tick and then create all these um, quick quirky character stories which I can thread the sort of town narrative through. And it, it, the idea is to develop it as, a, as an exhibition piece, almost like a 3D audio or visual scrapbook, which comes with, uh, but the fragments can be sort of anywhere. So I'm also working with sort of um, a television production company to do a half hour sort of um, uh, photo montage type piece uh, for, uh, um, as a drama. Um, I've also got a, a play underway. So, and I really like the idea that one story can be told not only fragmented in style, but maybe fragmented in media. The idea that, you know, all media is created equal. Bits of it could be a game. Bits of it could just be told through a series of debtor letters to an individual, or another bit could be um, just just an audio experience. So, yes, yeah, so that's what I'm working on now. Uh, I'll, I'll be quiet now so we can get on with the next bit. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, so I don't really make sort of digital work or, uh, yeah, film works. Um, but I've been using film kind of in, for the last couple of years as like a way to sketch. Mm -hmm. um, so taking like screen recordings and screenshots and things and uh, audio uh, recording, yeah, as I'm editing things in Photoshop and stuff. Um, and yeah, it just seems like a really easy way to sort of make a sketch. Um, and yet it's only recently that I've been kind of thinking of these as works rather than just stuff that is on my phone or um, just exists on my computer. It's just like stuff. Cool. So yeah, um, and I like very sort of repet or well, yeah, I'm finding that I like very sort of looping repetitive uh, film works of like mm -hmm. GIFs, um, sort of barely a moving image, Okay, cool. I guess. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, yeah. Firstly, I think yeah, your, film, uh, your game looks absolutely beautiful. Thank you. Looks really nice. Um, I was just making some notes. So I guess I'm interested in like speculative technologies or like um, aesthetics that are, like pseudoscientific um, in my work. Um, and then I guess which makes me think of like you know in the I don't know like the sixties or whatever when people imagine people going into space and they had those lovely like space houses with the women with the yeah. vacuum cleaners and stuff. I find it kind of interesting that these two views of like the the past and the future because obviously yours is like like a very specific like aesthetic like the film noir, mm -hmm. um, which is super like dated and then even like speculative ideas of the future and things I think are also really dated so. Is there like a reason why you, you chose such a specific? Well, actually, I mean, the palette itself morphs and changes. I mean, there was a, that was only a very short, and a lot of it was from the front end. So the, the game was designed to sort of almost erode as the player was playing it. So the actual, the aesthetic at some point goes into quite neon. Um, and th there's a moment which is about halfway through where everything is basically 2D overlays. It does just look like a Dadaist collage of sort of stuff. And he goes to this building site where he meets all these horrific characters. And actually, I mean, it is 
Beckett isn't designed to be liked. That's the main thing I would say. It, 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 I mean, I love uh, the Czechoslovakian uh, filmmaker called Jan Schwankmeyer, and I take a lot of inspiration by his sort of the way he can make you feel actually just uh, experiencing his stuff. So this is designed to shift you emotionally. So in, in terms of the aesthetic at the beginning, it was meant to pull you into the sort of emotional turmoil of Beckett. So it, it played with a very saturated palette and stuff like that. And it was playing into some of the expectations. So you, so you as a character, a player could get plon, drawn into it. But there's a point where he goes into the, he goes into the building site and, th and then I, I think you saw it on the um, on the uh, on the video actually. And he throws a match down. And then you realise actually th they've dug under the two D aesthetic. So the world suddenly. Well, hold on. There's something below this two D world. And at that point, things you've broken the reality which you've almost set up. And then mm. he, go he ends up going to a park with all these monuments, and all the monuments are like two miles high. So you've got this flat world with these two. Uh, uh, so we start pushing up in different dimensions. And as those things start to happen at about, yes, yeah, about the halfway point, the whole game starts to break almost, and the perspective starts to shift, and then that noir feel sort of starts to get lost for something which is moving in other directions. So, um, yeah, but I, I suppose that was the... Um, that was the aesthetic which came out of it. I mean, I can't stress enough the sort of the importance of the audio, and I spent a long time creating the audio. So it's a, it's a combination of binaural audio. So it, it, the world has a very everything has a sense of place, um, and it, it, I spent a lot lot of time field recording stuff. So it it feels hopefully very rich. Um, mm. But no, it's it, it's a fair observation. I mean, it is a, a, a noir, um, so therefore it does fall into that. Um, but it does. I think if you play through it, you'll notice that it starts to break as well it, mm. intentionally where, where can you get it where is it can you get it online or where, uh, where yeah, can, uh, it's, well the part the problem we've got at the moment so this is like when I started making Beckett I mean I've always been about narrative like you know and storytelling whether it was in television or or writing and stuff like that so the intention here was to almost make it was a bit of a statement saying actually I do believe that uh, an interactive fiction or a video game can tell a story which can be stand shoulder to shoulder with literature, theatre or, or independent world cinema. That, that was the intention. It was released on Steam, which is a games platform um, for PC and Mac, but unfortunately that is very much for gamers. If you want a wider audience to play it, they've got to go there, they have to sign up to the Steam subscription, put in their account details. So it's a huge problem about the, the diversification of vid video games back into the days of interactive um, experiences, I suppose, back in the sort of 90s with CD-ROMs and stuff. I mean, it's a huge problem because actually the, the video games industry in terms of its transactional platforms have almost made it inaccessible for people who aren't gamers to get decent content. So there are things like itch.io and other places where you can do direct downloads, but they're not the, the mainstay. So you can get mm. it on Steam, you can get it on itch.io, or if you drop me an email, I'll send you a link. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Yeah, no, that's interesting, because I guess I feel quite, like, excluded from, like, I don't know a lot about games. And, like, you have to. Yeah, and then it seems like these areas, I don't, I don't know, are quite difficult to reach. But then when it is something like a story, I don't know, and then I'm just thinking about, like, Instagram stories and, like, all these ways of uh, consuming, like, visual information or narratives. Uh -huh. Um, and yeah, like my little sister uses Snapchat uh -huh. like obsessively. So yeah, I think I think I think probably we will find that when they, you know, I think there's two there's two things, isn't there? When, when the generation of people come through who really don't differentiate platform anymore, and it's not it's mm. about content, it's not about platform, but also when maybe we see people like Netflix and Amazon allowing sort of um, streaming games and obviously the games they mm. will stream in, stream initially will be much more aligned to the audience they've got. So like. What would somebody who's just watched the latest series of True Detective want to do as an interactive experience? And it's got to be simple, pick up and play, and something which you can almost just give it a shot. But mm. at the moment, it's very hard to give Beckett a shot because you've got to download a five gigabyte file generally from a, a server which is all geared up around computer games. Mm. So uh, yeah, I mean, that's the problem. But I think at the moment, it's more about creating stuff of, 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 of worth in that space, as I'm sure you're doing with your own practice, are you doing it to sort of as a statement and as a sort of emotional sort of um, release and, and, and just to sort of think, well, maybe the world needs this in some way? Questions? <laughs> um, okay, it works. Uh, this is a question for you. Have you ever used uh, social media uh, as a way of telling your stories? I mean, because they seem to come into the narrative so well, do you feel like that would be an interesting platform to work with? I mean, to, to situate um, 
this this poetic uh, what is it, tangential you know thoughts and uh, you know the stream of consciousness uh, way of writing within um, these uh, channels because I think it would be really interesting actually I don't know if you um, yeah no I do yeah it's from uh, the captions on Instagram pictures yeah. are usually what and then you can sort of con yeah. Um, so, like, usually taken from um, streams of automatic writing and then putting it there, yes. um, and sort of things being kind of misaligned with the images mm -hmm. um, and captions kind of disagreeing with each other. Yeah, because you but didn't yeah. introduce any of that aspect of uh, your practice. Uh, so no, uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. <laughs> give us a URL. Give us a handle. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. You can look. Yeah, I've got a website and Instagram. Mm -hmm. I think that's all right. Maybe you can just yeah speak about one thing and then people can look at that if they're interested yeah. I don't know I think okay. yeah maybe it's sometimes quite nice to hear something out of context yeah. or context context lists and then just apply it to whatever yeah. thoughts that you have yeah. and and Simon um, I'm very interested in your background actually um, were you an, a musician illustrator or whatever or, or have you always made games or um? well, I was very fortunate because my dad was um, youth theatre so I was involved in theatre um, but he was also an audio technician so I was in so, so my my upbringing was that I was in bands and stuff but um, I, I really wanted to be Bob Woodward, Bob Woodward from the, all the you know all the president's band <laughs> days I wanted I wanted to be a journalist and sort of break the big thing so I, I traveled down to London and learn to write effectively and I think the great thing about that as a, as a journalist you, you, you almost force yourself as writing becomes almost a second nature so I think that was a great thing because it means I, I found I could express myself quite well through words but then I ended up writing about television it got really into that and then when I moved up to Scotland I was employed as a TV development producer and then um, yeah then I discovered I say just really interested in like the potential that digital had and I was really lucky because in about 2006 um, all of the broadcasters decided they quite like this idea of multi-platform content, the idea that, ooh, maybe a, a property which exists on uh, television could exist across any platform. Um, so I set up a production uh, arm and, uh, within a TV company, um, which ended up me going off in all manner of different experimental ways. Because, you know, the idea is like, it, it, Digital, digital art needs to experiment to sort of develop it, it to mature, but there's not really many ways you can fund that, which is the problem. And, you know, and at the moment, in terms of the arts world, digital still isn't perceived as an, as an art in that way in terms of like the funding bodies and stuff. I mean, it, it's a create, they call it the creative industries as soon as you put the word digital in, which is sort of frustrating because actually the intent is the same right at the start. And you seem to get penalised by your form of expression, which, but even though I feel it's a liberation amongst all the rest. Um, so, yeah, and, and, and you know what, I'm sort of, um, I just feel I'm, I've been fortunate enough not to be bankrupt, basically, in, in my journey. You know, and I think, I think that's, the, that, that's the plight of any of that. So, yeah. Well, we feel your pain in terms of distribution, uh -huh. uh, something that we've dealt with for our entire careers. Uh -huh. um, so, yeah, but unfortunately, I wouldn't count on like there being a Netflix that's going to save you. So. No. But anyway, <laughs> not to be too grim, but I no, look no, forward yeah, to yeah, trying your true. game, absolutely. I'll download it from each you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Hi, thanks for both your talks. They're really interesting. Um, my question is about uh, avatars in both of the things you're talking about. You're talking about Lil Michaela, the yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, he's like this CGI force in like the fashion blogging influencer game, right? And mm. how you were talking about how you perceive her to be real or not real, and that kind of struck me as having kind of parallels with the invisible labor that we were talking out about earlier because obviously someone is driving her somewhere right we just don't know mm -hmm. necessarily who that agency or person is and how, how i'd like if, if you could explain how you kind of feel about her a bit more that'd be really interesting to me and it also struck me that it has parallels with the kind of audience relationship with beckett that you were talking about and how you don't quite know if you know them very well mm -hmm. um yeah it seemed that there might be something there um, yeah, so Little Michaela is an Instagram account um, that I was speaking about. Um, and I think at first glance, she's like quite realistic, like when, before you kind of zoom in on the images. And then, yeah, it's just really weird, like all these people interacting with her and like her captions is what I find really like upsetting. Like they're all, yeah, it's just really upsetting, and especially I think it was like a man who made her, who's like recently said who he is. I think, um, and I just find it like quite, 
yeah, just like really unnerving and upsetting that it was this like man kind of like puppeting this weird CGI like beautiful young girl who was like um, posted and then yeah I think like ownership in digital spaces is really interesting and then all these brands are trying to kind of collaborate with her and then she has like kind of no agency because she's just uh, like well a model I guess you know like she's just putting on clothes and taking them off again but has these allegiances and yeah I just find it really interesting and especially with like so many spam accounts and stuff on Instagram and then she like is and isn't because she has like opinions and like she was telling people to vote last week so like that's nice but like you know just yeah really strange mixed feelings yeah, uh, yeah I mean from Rebecca's point of view uh, I was just it, I mean the information about who he is slowly slowly emerges um He's not necessarily meant to be somebody you aspire to be or like. I mean, right from the start, he's sort of like, yeah, that's what you had a chance to read, but he is literally sort of picking the hair, picking the hair out of his nose while he's looking out over the city. And um, there's a lot of reference about the fact that he's not really up to speed on his personal hygiene anymore. You get a sense that he's sort of like an old car, which is just, un, un, he doesn't care anymore. So he is in this sense of decay. And I think it, it's bizarre because I think some people build a sympathy for him quite early on, but then a lot of people don't like him at the end. But actually, but, one thing which I was just reminded me of, which I thought I'd mention, which is quite interesting, is there's no real branching narrative in Beckett. It, 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 it's a dynamic narrative, so the things you do in each scene is reflected in the way the scene plays out, but it, it plays out, in, it, but the story always exists. The only branch at the end is right, right at the end, and there's two choices, and the two choices, it's a fairly meaningless choice, but you can still make the choice. But there were four kids played this and did a YouTube sort of uh, talk through of the whole thing. And they were talking through it and they kept going, ah oh, man, I hate this game. And because like, the way it makes them feel, they kept so in, they're saying, it's not that it's a bad game, I just don't like it. But anyway, they got through it, which I mean, actually quite like that comment, I might use that as my you know, maybe epitaph or something like that. But, um, but they got right to the end and they were all describing the last scene. So the game itself is probably about three and a half hours long. And they were all describing the last scene, and one of them said, oh, so I was doing this, I was, yeah, it's on the beach, the last scene. I was walking down the beach, and then I met this character, and he said that. And the, another, and the other one went, no, that didn't happen. I, no, I was, it's on the beach, but you meet this other character, and this happens. And then the third one was like, no, no, I, I got something different. And then they all got, then they all got really annoyed, going, what's with this game? I'm like, what, where were the choices which caused this? How, how can we do that? But they all played exactly the same thing. There are no, they, they literally step for step. But what had happened was, I think because it was so played in the abstract, it was so, it required so much of you, that they'd all painted different formats of what the game was. So when this final scene was given, they all, it was all theirs, it was theirs, it, was, it wasn't mine. I don't even know what the game they were playing was, you know, because all I was given was the emotional stimuli. So I thought that was great. And in terms of, I suppose in terms of avatars in a sense, that means that, that can, that's quite a flexible sort of spurious thing, isn't it? <laughs> Yeah, I had a, uh, Simon had a question. Um, I'm really kind of fascinated with the, there seems to be sort of a slippage today with the use of the term game. Mm -hmm. And, and that, that, I think, is really intriguing. I think even, even with Tale of Tales, I, I think you could categorize that maybe as a kind of visual social media platform uh -huh. in, in a way. And, and I think of, I look at your piece and I think back, you mentioned already, to like kind of 90s CD-ROM yeah. kind of aesthetic. And, and I, I remember back in the day making those things and I think mm -hmm. we didn't refer to them as games yeah. on purpose because there was this kind of stigma. Oh, it's not a game, it's it's serious, you know. Kind uh -huh. of, and, and, but we've come kind of in the, in the other direction and I just think it's kind of a interesting, because you still have that problem with games, like you know, oh, I, yeah, how, how many times you talk to people say, "Oh, I don't play games," or "I don't." You know, mm. well, of course you do. It's like, you know, it's like this very strange label that mm. I think is has uh, is really kind of problematic, and, and but but also essential. And I'm just wondering if you could, you know. No, it's true. I mean, like you know, sometimes you've got to judge your audience. Um, so if I, if I talk at a book fair, I don't even mention the word game. But sometimes if it slips out, I'll see half the eyes in the room close or something like that. So, but it is weird. I mean, it is just because it's it's more representative of the industry in which or, or the distribution network that that the product is going via. You know, and I think even the way that is, it's like, are you making television? We're all talking about well, that big thing which sits in the room. Are you making radio? But it's almost like we have to be more, the descriptor should be the content, not the, not the delivery mechanism. But unfortunately, it's just, <laughs> there's no, no alternative, is there? You can use things like, oh, it's an interactive experience, but then people go, what the hell's that? There you go, like, <laughs> so I sort of say it's a bit of digital fiction, but then even then people just go, well, like, you get on your Kindle. Or something. You know, it's, it's, it's a very strange place. So um, I would generally just say it's a 
surreal noir. And then if, if it's, it, I 100% know what you mean. But then back in the CD-ROM era, I mean, the reason I love that so much is when that the, the when that came about, the people who were making those were people like the residents over in America, you know, who like who, who created and they weren't they weren't game makers. They were multi, but multimedia storytellers would probably describe themselves as. Um, and then even Devo, the band Devo, made a game with Inkscape, I think it was at the time. And I just think the ideas there were brilliant. Maybe the technology wasn't quite there to sort of even realise the ideas, but. And then obviously we had the console thing, which was, uh, it's, it's, I'm sorry, this is, will take me two minutes then. But the console thing's really interesting. So the consoles came around about like PlayStation 1 was 94 or something like that. And it, it obviously that shifted the games, so I think, sh shifted the games to the landscape a bit. And it became more about adrenaline rushes and, 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 and sort of that sort of gratification passive time. And it was, the whole industry was described as a teenage thing. So it's like, oh, ki kids play games. And you even get that now. If you say, oh, I've made a game, we'll go, all oh, right, it's for kids. You know, and that's a really, that's more annoying than the fact that people go, I oh, don't play games. It's the fact that they assume you've, you're making something for a kid. But actually what's interesting now is I do feel that when people hit their mid-30s, and it, well, it's been proven that they start to get disenfranchised with what games are because actually they've, they've done games and their, their time profiles change. They want more out of their experiences. And I think what's maybe quite encouraging is those people who were 15 in 1994 are now in their late 30s now. So this new disenfranchisement are actually of, of, of those, those gamers who are mass. But then we've also got the lapse gamers, and I just think we need to capture that again. And I did think in PlayStation 3 era when we had things like Journey, and there was a great um, thing from the demo scene called Linger and Shadows, which went on to it. I was just, oh, PlayStation 3 is going to try and capture this wider audience again. But then unfortunately, the whole PlayStation 4 thing was about it's for the players. And I've spoken to PlayStation loads, and I'm like, no, no, we have to maintain a market share of gamers now. So I don't know, it's hard. I don't think we should stop doing it, but it is. <laughs> it's frustrating, isn't it? And the, the, mon the game moniker is part of that frustration as well. Time for one more question, sir. No? Okay. Oh, yeah, okay. It's a very short question. It's a short question with a long answer. Yeah, yeah, it's very short. <laughs> it's, uh, no, right when you were talking about touching and, you know, and saying this, our biggest organ and, and, and neglected. I was looking around and everybody was touching their screens. <laughs> so I wonder what you feel about that kind of touch. Um, yeah, because I think like, that's the thing we touch most, right? And then I, I think like, that's why I started thinking about all these things, like trying to speak about uh, when, yeah, I first sort of asked to do this talk and then it was just trying to figure out like how to speak about these things and I realised it was just like pawing at my phone because I didn't mm -hmm. really want to be doing anything else and like yeah I think there's something really a bit sad about like our inability to like access what's actually like within the devices which is surely like connectivity and then we're kind of like stuck we keep on like a kind of fly against the window pane or something <laughs> so like, really, yeah there's something really like sad and like wistful about kind of like yeah and then, I don't know, then all the fingerprints that are left on that screen, and like, yeah, it's just, yeah, something really sad. <laughs> on that cheery note. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> That's great. Thank you guys both so much. Also, if Thank anybody you. wants a copy of Marnie Wicks, there's about seven copies <laughs> there, so please do grab one. Nice, <laughs> no, sorry. Yeah.